You definitely don't need me to tell you this, but 2020 has been one hell of a year. Not so much for gaming either, it's just been what we like to call one of those years. A year where we cannot fathom just how impossibly wrong every single tiny little thing went. And dear god did everything go wrong this year. But other people have already talked about that and that's not what this channel's about, so let's just talk about this year's video games, shall we? I'm going to do this a little differently than I did last year because if there's one thing consistent about me, it's my inconsistency. Instead of giving an award title or generic Gotti award, I'm going to present a few games that I've played this year and provide them with an award based on how they made me feel, how much fun I had and so on. Somewhat similar to last year's arbitrary awards, but this time I'm even more ground down by the fact that this year has been just terrible for gaming for peasants like me who couldn't get hold of a PS5 and so couldn't play the Demon Souls remake that they've been desperately begging for now for over a decade. Let's kick things off with a nice easy going jaunt into the jolly depths of hell with promising indie darling, Visage. This game was polarising for many creators that I hold in high regard. John Wolfe and Minx both expressed frustration with the game, its story, its gameplay, and in the case of the former, specifically with its portrayal of mental illness in its early chapters. The game was in early access for a while before being released in full this past October, concluding with four chapters and polished visuals, gameplay, story, and more. The game is relatively pain-free in terms of performance, with stellar visuals that evoke an excellent atmosphere, particularly owing to the fact that it balances its inevitable jump scares with an equivalent amount of actual tension and creeping horror. I thoroughly enjoyed the canonical chapter 2, but it was only this year that I got around to playing chapter 1, and when I eventually reached chapter 3, my opinion of the game had completely nosedived. I adored chapter 2 of Visage. It was everything I wanted from an indie horror game, barring the occasional frustrating death from some lunatic old lady with a knife. Even so, it showed great potential, and so with the advent of its full 1.0 release, I was excited to see what else it had in store. If I had played Chapter 1 before 2, I would have refunded this game. I don't know if Chapter 1 was any different when the game first appeared in Early Access, but its final state is appalling. Although definitely creepy at times with much of the tension that makes Dolores' chapter good fun, the incessant trial and error necessitated by the chapter's spawn-camping main bad guy, its looping corridors that ate PT, numerous dead ends that force a death and restart and a lot more besides all drag down the promise shown by its second chapter. The more I played this game, the more frustrated I was, until I reached a section where a man made of goo walked slowly towards me and I had to escape into a vent that was not indicated in any way, shape or form, in a game where the sprint button is more of a lean forward a little bit button. It's a shame because there are so many great things about Visage. The game is undeniably gorgeous and the house is evocative of past Resident Evil games with a splash of Silent Hill 4 whenever doors start chaining themselves up. But all the lighting and shading in the world can't disguise what ultimately turned out to be just another shallow, unfulfilling indie horror game with baffling puzzles, a spongy protagonist, and a desperate need to have you interact with every single individual drawer to find the one item that you missed. And when there's a monster breathing down your neck and that one random cupboard instantly kills you for no particular reason, that style of gameplay gets old very quickly. Therefore, I'm awarding Visage the A Promise Unfulfilled Award. I've often put it forward to my partner that the reason I never really cared for the Half-Life series is because I played Deus Ex first, whereas he has never finished a Deus Ex game because he was far too enamoured with the Half-Life franchise. He's intimately familiar with the series' ins and outs in exactly the same way that I could probably draw the maps for every level of the original Deus Ex from memory. As the years have gone by, I have given Half-Life 2 a shot, but gave up at the point at which I was driving a very rickety vehicle on a cliff road out of boredom. The effect that Half-Life has had on the industry is absolutely undeniable, but you don't have to enjoy something to appreciate its impact. So when it came to Black Mesa, I gave it a shot to see if the fresh coat of paint would engage me with a game franchise I've otherwise ignored, and to my very great surprise, it actually did. 
Black Mesa is a stunning and loving recreation of one of PC gaming's giants, and the amount of effort and dedication poured into the game even before Valve got involved is not just clear to see, but stunning. Beyond just looking superior to the original, Black Mesa features a full-fledged soundtrack that's actually enjoyable to listen to outside the game, reworked voice acting, and from what I understand, a massively expanded zen section. The attention to detail in Black Mesa is outstanding, and whilst I may have no real love for the Half-Life series, I can appreciate the ridiculous amount of time and effort that's gone into this game, more than eight years in the making, and at last, fully realised. Because of this, I'm giving Black Mesa the congratulations, you made me enjoy a game I never cared about award. I've made no great secret of the fact that this year's Resi remake, closer to a reimagining of the iconic third entry Nemesis, was a massive disappointment for me. I adore the original game, and I was a huge fan of the Resi 2 remake despite its flaws and subpar B scenarios. But where Resi 2 felt like a brand new experience grounded in the framework of its forefather, that brought new life and sublime visual gratuity to the same beloved characters and even more beloved RPD, Resi 3 feels like more of a slap in the face. I've already talked about all this in my Resi 3 review, which I'll link in the description below if you're interested, so instead of harping on about the game's lack of content, muted story and underuse of its core antagonists, let's just quickly run through the positives. The game came out right when the UK entered its first lockdown, and I was unbelievably excited for its arrival. Whilst I don't feel like I got what I wanted, the experience I did have was nonetheless enjoyable when I removed myself from the bias of loving the original Nemesis. Jill is my favourite character, and despite her severe case of the potty mouth in the remake, I will say that this is probably my favourite iteration of her character thus far. Relative newcomer Nikki Lee Tompkins did a great job with the material she had, making the unreasonably plot-armoured Jill Valentine feel believably human, emotive and frightened, while still being able to hold her own against the monstrosities of Raccoon City. If Capcom intends to remake more of the older games, I'd like them to turn their hand to Code Veronica, or perhaps create a version of the Game Boy Color exclusive Resident Evil Gaiden, which was impossible to buy at launch in the UK and remains impossible to buy without spending a small fortune. If they do so, I'd prefer they went into future remakes with the ethos that Resi 2 had rather than Resi 3, but if that doesn't turn out to be the case, it's not really a big deal. After all, a brand new version of a beloved classic doesn't erase the original from existence. Capcom have been making great strides recently, with Resi 7 being a strong return to form, DMC5 providing one of the most ridiculously fun romps I've had in a game these last few years, and the Resi 2 remake was my game of the year for 2019, but no company is free from missteps. I only hope that Resi 3's remake shows that fans want more of the classic Resi characters, just not if it means losing huge swaths of story in the chaos. Despite its flaws, and despite my frustration with the amount of cut content, I still maintain a begrudging respect for what Resi 3 tried to do, and so I give this game the Not What I Wanted, But Not Without Merit award. I don't play multiplayer games, I know I've said this a lot, in fact I'm pretty sure that was the opening line of my review for this very game. Regardless, after seeing a few streamers having a ton of fun with Phasmo, I picked it up along with a few friends and thus far I've had a good 30 to 40 hours of pure ridiculous fun. The game is still in early access, so based on the loosely defined rules I've been sticking to, it shouldn't really be in a list of games of the year, but uh... Eh, screw it, this is my arbitrary awards list and based entirely on the fact that this game lets you merge into hideous beasts with your friends whilst you wait for that one slow player to load in, I'm awarding Phasmo the Just Don't Screw It Up award. It's very unlikely that I'll be making a video about this one. Not because I don't have anything to say, but rather because I just don't see the point. This game has been torn to shreds and reassembled into a shambling corpse. There's been shady PR, deliberate withholding of information on performance issues, evidence of missing content, broken promises around industry crunch time, and a refund debacle that is still ongoing at the time of writing. Every single turn that CDPR have taken since this game's launch has been one wobbly step forward and another straight back, 
treading an extremely thin line between disingenuous and outright begging for a second chance. There's been a lot of talk recently around the problems with Cyberpunk beyond just the visual glitches, the base PS4 and Xbox One performance issues and its demanding PC specs, with some pointing at issues with its writing, pacing, story structure and much more besides. Some say it has no soul, others say it has plenty. Major players in the gaming world have been hugely polarised on this game, and those I tend to agree with the most have been split down the middle on whether or not they actually like it. As for me? I like it. I like it a lot. Despite the problems, despite the dodgy performance, which on my PS4 Pro at least hasn't been anywhere near the level of unplayable that both Assassin's Creed Valhalla and Watch Dogs Legion have been, both of which I've had to abandon because they simply do not function properly on my console, Despite every stupid, shady and outright shitty decision that CDPR have made, despite the horrible car controls and the simultaneously great motorbike controls, despite the strange audio glitches, the T-posing, the weird texting system, the multiplying chopsticks, the devillery instead of delivery, despite all of that, I like this game. I like Cyberpunk 2077. Did it need more time? Absolutely. Undeniably, it needed more time. It needed at least six more months, if not significantly longer. A release date should never have been announced after the initial delay. There should have been transparency around the console performance. Are there things I would have liked to have seen? Hell yes, I want more motorbikes, dammit. I want my origin stories to be more fleshed out and have more meaning. I want Keanu Reeves to stop sounding so goddamn bored every time he opens his mouth. But I went into this game with zero expectations. I was unfamiliar with Cyberpunk 2020 beyond basic knowledge, I hadn't watched any of the trailers after the initial announcement, nor had I seen any interviews, podcasts, speculation videos, any of the Night City Wire events. I had no knowledge of things the devs promised would be in the game, no idea what was and was not supposed to be there. And because of that, just like the time I went to see the Meg in cinemas expecting absolutely nothing, I came out having had an absolute blast. Does that excuse CDPR's actions? No. Not at all. Does that change the fact that I enjoyed the game I got in the end? No. So, I'm giving Cyberpunk 2077 the despite everything that happened, I enjoyed this game award. A few brief honourable mentions should be given to Control's Steam release with the DLC included, which is equally as batshit and incredible as it was when it first launched last year. Alongside this, I've put an ungodly amount of time into Neo 2, but I haven't finished it yet. And, of course, a tip of the cap to Hades, which I haven't actually played, but it has kept my other half entertained for many, many hours, so it can't be all that bad. Honestly, this isn't the kind of game I would have ever considered to be a GOTY for me, so the fact that it essentially wins Game of Year by default sounds so much more terrible than it's intended, as if I'm suggesting that the game was just less bad than the majority of other releases for 2020. But that's not the case at all, I'm just not used to having huge epic open world games have almost zero technical issues as well as having an engaging story driven by a strong emotional heart, be the one game that stood head and shoulders above literally everything else released this year. I have a few problems with Ghost of Tsushima, most prominently the fact that the lip-syncing is very noticeably meant for the English voice acting only, which on the one hand is incredibly distracting, but on the other is also a testament to just how far facial animation has come. Very occasionally, the stealth felt a little bit off, and there always seemed to be far too many gadgets meant to solve a problem that could easily be fixed with a pointy stick, with no real need to engage with much beyond the sword and bow. Whilst there is a lot of fluff in the game, the usual collectibles scattered about may look like they clog up the map, although you'll quickly forget about that minor gripe when you see an adorable little fox on the horizon. And its side quests can sometimes feel like they accidentally derail an otherwise strong, tight narrative. These are minor flecks of dust on an otherwise obsessively polished gem of a game, created by a company with clear reverence for the culture it depicts, whose visual gratuity is simply stunning almost beyond words, and who take the crown for the only moment in all of gaming in 2020 that actually choked me up, right at the end of Jin Sakai's tale. The game's final few missions sealed the deal for me. 
Masterfully crafted, obsessively reverent and beautifully realised, Ghost of Tsushima is the perfect combination of technical mastery, visual gratuity and mechanical prowess that's proven to be rare this year. There have been a scant few games in 2020 that have emboldened me with the same sense of pride I felt when I defeated a powerful enemy without so much as a scratch, or completed a full takedown streak flawlessly, or snapped into ghost mode and engaged that retro samurai film black and white filter as I mercilessly slaughtered my enemies. Jin's story was a pleasure to witness, and it is a worthy winner of any and all Game of the Year awards, including my own utterly arbitrary Gotti. And so, that's that. Oh wait, I'm sorry, I forgot something. Yeah, let me just... Uh...